everyone. I'm Rory McGuire. I'm a professor and extension specialist at Virginia Tech, and I am for the soil because the soil is our future. We don't make any more of it. If you eat, you rely on soil. Fall is in the air, and it is a wonderful time of the year. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of For the Soil, a conversation. I'm your host, Jeff Ishi, and we'll get to the podcast in just a moment, but I do have a, a special announcement. We're coming up on the first anniversary for For the Soil, a conversation, the podcast. We started it in mid-October last year, and it's hard to believe that uh, we now have d- been doing this for a, a full year. We've had the opportunity to meet some really interesting people, and we're planning a special podcast coming up sometime in mid to late October that will be a best of, and that, that will be just little snippets of conversation from various guests we've been honored to have on the podcast, and we hope that you'll tune in for that. That will be sometime in mid to late October as we celebrate the first anniversary of the podcast. Well, speaking of the podcast, let's get this thing rolling. Welcome back to For the Soil, a conversation. I'm your host, Jeff Ishi, and Eric Benfelt and Mary Sketch Bryant are joining us. And returning for part two of our conversation is Mr. Steve Grothin. Southeast Pennsylvania. Eric, if you would do the pleasure of reintroducing our special guest. Yes, we're pleased to have Steve Groff with from Cedar Meadow Farm and also uh, cover crop coaching and uh, the farmer and author and longtime soil health champion. So welcome, Steve. Well, thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure and honor to uh, be a part of our conversation today. Mary, if you want to start yeah, off. Yeah, and Steve, um, we were talking some in the last episode about your new book and, and I'm really excited to read it and, you know, think about how consumers can be more supportive of farmers who are doing soil health practices, thinking about cover crops and, you know, beyond maybe a farmer's market where they can directly ask a farmer what they're doing. What are, what are some of the mechanisms for consumers to be supportive and engaged? Well, um, that's a, that's a really, really good question. And, and one that I don't have a, a specific black and white answer for. I, I will mention quick, I didn't say it in my previous episode. You can pick up my book at stevegroff.com. stevegroff.com. You can pick up my book there. So farmers markets or, or your farm stand down the road is clear to the best. If it's your neighbor, or if you're located in a rural area, just, just to understand what you're doing. This is, this is again, why I wrote the book to help people understand what to do. Now, if you're buying your produce at Walmart, you'll probably never meet the farmer who grew it. It's just the way it is. Uh, so right now, in the context of, of, of what we have available, there is, you know, I just encourage people to try to eat right, uh, try to use the, the, the superfoods and, and, and so forth. Um, and of course, try to, try to support your local farmers wherever you can. That is clearly... But I want to bring up maybe a new little topic here, and I mentioned in my book, is the nutrient density meter that I'm working with the Bionutrient Food Association with. And uh, I have the second generation of it uh, in my hands here, and uh, we're testing it. It's not quite ready yet, but the goal of that is, is that consumers will literally be able to shop for their tomatoes, we'll say. I could say at Walmart if you shop there. Uh, and you'll be able to literally get a reading on the nutrient density of the various tomatoes that are there in the shelf. So if that does fully come to fruition, that will be a game changer. Uh, and so I'm a part of that. Uh, it's going to take some time, probably years yet, but that'll really answer the question then of how to get nutrient dense food and healthy food. But until then try to buy local and, and then, you know, People say, well, what questions should I ask the farmer? And, you know, do they use cover crops? Are they trying to use dust tillage? I mean, some of those basic things that, that probably our audience knows all about. Uh, but but there's some of the basic things to get started. And Steve, I have two questions, but maybe stepping back, if you just define nutrient density, if you're not familiar with that term. Yeah, so we know what nutrients are. And if you have a... Uh, a, a a nutrient, we think of things that are common like calcium. 
but some that are not as kind of not as common, like selenium. Selenium helps with some immunity things, um, uh, zinc, and so forth. The problem in the past is we have starved out or killed the microbes that can essentially take those minor use minerals and get them into the plant because of the overuse of synthetic fertilizers and because of the overuse of tillage. And I'm gonna leave it at that because that's a whole session in itself. But if we let the soil come alive, a lot of our soils have these nutrients. If they don't, we need to apply them. So what we wanna do is when you eat a tomato, I keep using tomatoes because I grow them. <laughs> if you eat a tomato, I want the tomato you eat from my farm to have more selenium in it, to have more vitamins, more minerals, other minerals, the phytochemicals that are out there. And these, there's, there's the good things, by the way. And, and so the way you do that is directly related to how you grow that food. Now there's genetics and the varieties that factor in and soil types, all this stuff. But there's certain things farmers can manage and that's one of the things. So we're trying to get more nutrients, healthier nutrients, so when you eat your produce, you're getting more into your body that will hopefully you know, set you up to fend off chronic diseases and stuff. And I, I like to say that we live longer than ever, but we're sicker than ever as a society. Again, another topic for another show. But this is what we're trying to address. Steve, I want to ask you about organic matter in soil. Uh, a lot of soil scientists that we've had on the program, they they stress uh, the different levels of organic matter. And, and they've gotten into kind of a deep dive of how you measure it and so forth. But for the for the average farmer, how important is organic matter? And, and where should it be if you measure it? So organic matter is very important and it can be a key indicator to the health of your soil. But as we know, you go across different geographical areas of the world, it can vary, it can vary according to what it is now, it can vary according to what it was. The standard I use on my farm is my woods because I'm from Pennsylvania, Penn's Woods. It was my land 300 years ago, would have been all trees. So I have taken soil samples in my woods and I'm at 8% organic matter in my woods. My fields have been 2.5% about 30, 40 years ago. Now they're 5.5. So I've more than doubled, almost tripled in some of my fields. Uh, and, and I've kind of plateaued a little bit here in the last four or five years. So I'm now, I'm, I'm, I'm learning, I want to take it up to 8%. That's my goal. I don't know if I'll do it in my lifetime. Uh, but that's my goal. So organic matter helps hold more moisture, keeps our soils more resilient from weather extremes. You know, the basic stuff like that, more organic matter is good. Uh, how you get there is somewhat complex, but really it boils down to two things. Lessen your tillage or no-till and use cover crops or have plants living year round that are constantly sequestering CO2, putting it in your soil as carbon, which essentially is organic matter. And Steve, what you said just there of, you know, how you do it is complex. How do you work with other farmers who want to make that move forward? But it, you know, how do you, what is the next step? And especially where cover crops, one mix may work on one farm and it may not meet the goals of another farmer. Um, how do you work with them? So I take each farmer according to what they want to accomplish. I don't really care so much where they're at. It's what they want to accomplish and where they're headed. So number one, what does the farmer want to accomplish? And if it's increasing organic matter, well then obviously you're gonna to have to maximize the use of cover crops uh, and, and so forth. And, and, or if you wanna get a little more nitrogen and you wanna to lean toward legume cover crops, what do you wanna accomplish? And then when we're talking about where, how do we uh, you know, fit in those puzzle pieces? Well. What time of the year do you have a planting window to insert a cover crop? And then we can talk about the species to be used or the mix of the species and so forth. So what are you trying to accomplish? What time of the year of it is it? And then we go from there. And what I strongly suggest farmers do, I mean, it's one thing for me to give them advice, but if they know someone in the area who's actually doing a similar uh, goal of what they're trying to accomplish, lean on them, talk to them. Most farmers are very willing to share what they're doing. So when you have those things decided, who's your mentor? And get someone who's doing what you wanna accomplish. 
There's a lot of naysayers out here. Uh, but if you're serious about this, you got to surround yourself with the people who want to accomplish your same goals. That may be someone on the other side of the world that you have a connection with that could have a geographical similarity that it could be helpful. But having a mentor is very important to uh, being successful and being effective in making regenerative agriculture principles work. And Steve, this question might build off of that one, but then also in the previous episode, you mentioned about having a 10 year plan. I know we're farmers here in the central Shenandoah Valley. We have a lot of dairy farmers and it's been a pretty rough time over the past seven years or so. And uh, hearing it's the idea of a 10 year plan that might seem pretty formidable. If somebody wants early success, what would you recommend? I'll have to tell you a really quick, quick, quick story. I just did a webinar a month ago for farmers in Ukraine who didn't get their crops planted because of the war. And they were saying, well, what can I grow this summer? And I, and I suggested the 10 year plan idea and they're like, no, 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 no. We just wanna survive this year. And it really hit me hard because I'm like, oh my goodness. That's, it, it made me grateful for, for what we have here. But so I get your point. And, and so you have to have everything in context. I understand the dairy industry right now, the milk prices are back up. How, how long is that going to last? I don't know. So I don't have a straight up answer for that because every farm is going to be different. I just talked to a farmer here locally. He's 65 cows. He's, he's not an Amish either. Uh, and, and, and it's like, he's making it work. How? The farm's paid off. Third generation farm. So that's his situation. So he has some wiggle room, you might say. He survived. So all I have to say is, I probably don't have enough time to, I, I would have to know the specific information. Again, learn all you can. Talk to your local farmers in your local area, probably is my best advice uh, to do what you can. Steve, I wanted to ask you about networking with other like-minded farmers. For instance, on Facebook, there is a group called Hay Kings. More than 60,000 members worldwide, 24 seven, they're talking hay, hay quality, how to make hay, equipment, all of that sort of thing. Is there, are there similar resources, maybe YouTube, social media, Facebook for cover crop? enthusiast you mentioned facebook there's lots of cover crop and soil health groups i'm a member of a lot of them i mean like a dozen of them maybe <laughs> some of them are very active some of them are depend some of them are very specific to certain geographic reasons i would encourage anybody everybody to join that i think the most that the best group i get out of is some personal um we use whatsapp some people use twitter uh that's a personal group um even just texting you can form groups and i'm involved in a couple of them and it's like-minded just like-minded farmers and we just bring up questions that we have or brilliant ideas we think we might have uh and and it's just been a and, and the group i'm with is is all over the u.s and canada about a dozen farmers and that's been one of the best resources because they're they're kind of at this place where I'm at in, 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 in their journey of soil health. So I would strongly encourage anybody to join up. Um, and I think the old days of just going to a couple extension meetings in the winter are over. Uh, not against them. I think they're good, but we need real time stuff and we need, you know, to connect more with the farmers who are doing what we're doing. The good thing about it is when I started this 20, 30, even 40 years ago when I started no-till, there was nothing like this. And we kind of had to forge our own way. It was a lonely way. And I got to tell you, I never, ever imagined that I'd be doing interviews and podcasts and stuff on soil health. That's not what I started out to do. I just wanted to close the ditches in my field. That's it. And uh, that's led to all this. So it's kind of interesting when you reflect back. And Steve, you have been on a journey. I, I don't know if you could mention maybe key mentors or sources of inspiration in this journey. Um, yeah, I think Dr. Ray Weil comes to mind as a researcher at the University of Maryland. He's really what got me um, 
intentionally into this cover crop thing. And it's kind of interesting because we kind of have a parallel path. He was asking the same questions I was as a researcher. And that really was key to get me uh, jump started. I mean, I think of Gabe Brown, Ray Archuleta, uh, some of the national speakers out there now, Rick Clark is, uh, is, is out there speaking. Um, and I could list a, a, a bunch of names. I, I was a ferocious reader uh, back in the 90s, gathering up all the books I could that were written. There wasn't many. Uh, I have a whole bookshelf of books. I, I do like to read. I think whatever works now, now people listen to audiobooks. That's not my thing. I'm too old for that, I guess. Uh, but there's so many resources out there. My caution, though, is when you hear uh, someone talk about their, their grandiose ideas that they have, you know, do they, are they able to back it up? Are they able to translate to your specific region? And I will say again, context is everything. And just because it works in a Western state doesn't mean it's going to work in the mid Atlantic. We all know that, but keep that in mind. It may, I've learned some very pivotal things from around the world. Uh, but there's some things that just will not work on my farm and vice versa. Some things that I do won't work uh, elsewhere. I, when I'm in another country, I would say if I would move here to this region, I would not be farming the same way I do in southeastern Pennsylvania. So context is everything. Well, Steve, it's been a real pleasure to have you as a guest of our podcast, For the Soil, a conversation. Once again, your website is? stevegroff.com and your new book uh, entitled the future proof farmer changing mindsets and a changing world is available at that website thank you steve you're welcome and thank you eric and mary for joining us yes thank, thank you, you jeff. jeff and thank you thank steve, you, steve. One quick reminder for all of our listeners, and that, of course, is our website, forthesoil.org, and that is the digit for thesoil.org, and there you can discover the four core principles of soil health. For the Soil, a conversation is made possible with funding support from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and the Agua Fund. Other partners include the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, Virginia Cooperative Extension, Virginia State University, Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation, and partners of the Virginia Soil Health Coalition. Views expressed on this podcast are those of each individual guest. To download a copy of this or any other episode, visit the website forthesoil.org. And if you have a specific question about soil health, just call your local extension office, your local USDA service center, or a soil and water conservation district office. Music used during today's program was provided courtesy of Pottington Bear and the Flip Charts, all rights reserved. For the Soil, a conversation is produced by On the Farm Radio in collaboration with Virginia Tech. I'm your host, Jeff Ishii.